Well, it's great to be back here at Emory. Emory is a fantastic university, and I miss all of you. And it's uh, quite an honor to be here to speak at uh, TEDx Emory. Thanks for the invitation. So what I want to talk to you about today is uh, something uh, that's very special about Emory and something that I'll take with me wherever I go. And it has to do with a certain philosophy of education uh, that was articulated by a former president called James Laney and is continuing now with a president called uh, Jim Wagner, or J-Wags as we like to call him. <laughs> and that is that education is not only of the heart, of, uh, not only of the mind, but also of the heart. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, is how universities as remarkably powerful social engines uh, can be tweaked or reinvented to help create through you, the students of colleges, uh, colleges and universities, uh, social agents, change agents, game changers that can really tackle global challenges of the world. So this is this beautiful world from outer space. And if you pay attention, you'll see as it zooms like Google Earth from outer space to where I work now, the University of Cincinnati. So let's see if this works. Well, before we do that zoom, let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of those real world, world problems that we all have to together tackle. They include famine and hunger, incurable diseases, a problem with water, where in many parts of the world, women and children have to walk for many hours to get a few gallons of water. And many children and women die because there's not enough potable water to drink. And of course, a significant problem of sustainable energy as energy reserves dry up around the earth. So what can we, as university professors, as provosts, as students do to try to tackle these grand challenges? So if you do this, you will actually see, there's our football stadium there, what the University of Cincinnati looks like. And it's a fantastic place. I hope you can come take a road trip up there and come visit my new digs. So what can we as academics and students do? The world is becoming smaller, and therefore we have the potential to really have an impact on the world and to tackle some of these real problems. The needs are greater, as you saw in the first slide. So the question is, how can we in universities reinvent American higher education to prepare future global citizens? So, University of Cincinnati, or UC as, as we call it, has a history of innovating, of reinventing American higher education. You can see this chap on the left, his name is uh, Herman Schneider. He was a dean of engineering at UC in 1906. He would eventually become a provost and a president. And you can see to the right, right of him, in this uh, sort of brown old photograph, a picture of the first cooperative education class. The cooperative education, or co-op, was invented at UC about a century ago. And the only thing that they did wrong was the first class didn't have any women in it. So you can see that over here, the first female uh, group of students that uh, participate in cooperative education. And the funny thing is, I, I interact with the board of trustees right now, and they were a little bit nervous. Whenever you try to reinvent something, they're nervous, and they said, you may try this cooperative idea of education for one year only, for the failure of which we will not be held responsible. And as you probably know, co-op programs are found now in hundreds of universities around the world, including Georgia Tech, Purdue, Northeastern, MIT, and in many different countries, universities such as University of British Columbia. And I'll tell you a little bit about what it is. Funny thing is, at the, at the one century celebration of cooperative education, the Board of Trustees, many of whom I know, say, we take full responsibility for the success of cooperative education. So the, uh, the, the theory of cooperative education is this. It's really the birth of experiential learning, which is really at the hallmark of what many universities are trying to introduce into curricula today. So basically what you have is uh, it takes a little bit longer in the co-op model of education because what you do is you intercalate in between classroom, didactic, and laboratory education, real world experiences shown here in blue. So all of these are the quarter system at UC. All these red squares are actually 
quarters where you're actually in classrooms or in laboratories as you are in a typical American university. And these blue uh, quadrants here are actually periods of time, quarters, where the student actually leaves the university and works in a laboratory, works uh, in, a, in, a, in a job. And, and there's an alignment of what they're learning in the real world situation, what happens in the classroom. And there's constant feedback and assessment of whether or not they have attained certain uh, competencies against certain rubrics about what they're learning. And that continuously improves and, and, and feeds back into a specialized curriculum that's designed for that major and for that student. That's the theory behind cooperative education. And there's a lot of benefits to the co-op model. First, it really helps students get jobs. A lot of parents, and maybe some of you, are interested in getting jobs. And if you spend these periods of time intercalated between your classes, actually working in a company or in a laboratory, we find that we have, they have more success actually landing a job at the end of their college career because the employer already knows them. We have about 1,500 employers around the world that employ our students, and there are about 6,000 of our 42,000 students that are off campus at any given time. The amazing thing is that they're paid while they're going to school and working their job. And in 2011 alone, the students that were off campus were earning $43 million a year in aggregate, not individually. <laughs> and that amount of money actually in many cases was enough for our students to pay in totality their whole college education, tuition and room and board. So that's one advantage of the cooperative model. It takes one year longer, but you have a heightened chance of getting a job and you can pay for your education. Now, that was an innovation that we did about a century ago. It was very powerful, transformed American education. We're involved in other experiments. Uh, Franz works with monkeys. We work with primates too, but they're you guys, human beings. And so this is the second iteration of the experiment. This is a fantastic violinist. Her name is Midori. And she makes beautiful music with one instrument. If you add to her several more instruments, a viola, another violin, a cello, then what you find is that there are many more sounds. The complexity of the, of the music that you can create with multiple individuals is, is, is in many ways more interesting than what you, do, what you can achieve with one instrument. If you expand that to an orchestra, a symphony, you have scores of instruments, hundreds of musicians, and what you can achieve with that, that team approach, is very powerful. So the current innovation we're working at at UC has to do with this. This is a schematic of the traditional American classroom where you have a professor from one college teaching, you can see all the students, are of the same color. Predominantly, they're students of the same major. What's amazing about this new paradigm is this. The new classroom that we are inventing at UC is very different from the classroom in a typical American university. So you can see you have an intentional, intentional situation where we mix at the very beginning of their educational experience students from different colleges. You can see they're all different colors and they're, they have, uh, they're taught by multiple professors from different colleges. And we have an introductory course called the BIG course, where students are taught to think in an interdisciplinary way, to approach problems from multiple angles, and to learn to work as teams. And after that introductory course, what we do is we introduce people from the outside, from companies, from NGOs, from civic organizations that bring real world, real problems, like the ones that I showed you around the globe, into the classroom. So somebody from Duke Energy may bring a real problem about sustainable energy into this group. Uh, somebody from the Gates Foundation might bring a real problem about famine or potable water, and so forth and so on. And so we intentionally, from a very early stage, teach humans to work as teams and to think across the disciplines they still major in engineering, in architecture, in design, in arts and sciences, in mathematics, but we intentionally create 
an environment that they will have to experience when they leave college, whether they be a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist, to work as a team. Because the power of having multiple people working together is just as powerful as adding additional musicians to an ensemble. So this is experiential learning. The first model was cooperative education. That means an engineering student will go to a company and work on an engineering problem. But you can see that the current second 2.0 version that we're working on, I'll give you three examples and how that paradigm can be very powerful in addressing real world problems. The first is an off-campus studio funded by the chair of the Board of Trustees, Buck Niehoff, that focuses on problems in inner city Cincinnati, the Niehoff Urban Studio. The second is what we call Village Life, that focuses on problems far, far away in Tanzania. And the third is something we call the Live Well Collaborative, that focuses on a certain a segment of the population, that is the baby boomer population, as they become older, and the special problems and services and products that we have to create to, to serve that uh, generation of society. So the first thing I'll talk to you about is the Niehoff Urban Studio. It was founded in 2002, so we have quite a bit of experience uh, in this experiment, if you will. Uh, it's located a little bit off campus, and the vision of this paradigm is to engage the community, the Cincinnati community, nearby community, and to take these teams of students and faculty and to educate them by giving them real problems in the inner city of Cincinnati. And the way we do it is, as, as, as you saw in the paradigm, we create interdisciplinary teams of faculty, students, and community members to introduce the problem into the classroom and then give them time to try to solve that problem and to, by doing so, improve the quality of life in inner city Cincinnati. So you can actually see here uh, a faculty member uh, uh, bringing together students from different colleges, working on real world problems. And we focus on problems, so we have a real a blueprint, a roadmap of how you can solve those problems. And at the end of this process, the students write theses, and they produce books that are really the roadmap of how you can solve these issues in Cincinnati. So it takes a lot of time. This is not a one quarter course or a one semester course. They focus on this for a block of two years at a time. So from 2002 to 2004, they focused on the problem of urban food. How do you get food efficiently from the distribution centers to certain parts of very poor regions of inner city Cincinnati? From 2004 to 2006, the focus was on uh, the Over, Over the Rhine project. And that was a part of the, uh, of the city uh, which uh, is dilapidated. And they focused on that. From 06 to 08, they focused on uh, area around the University of Cincinnati um, and, and it resulted in a real uh, revitalization in the housing around the, around the university. And between 08 and 011, focused on uh, transportation within the city. And between 2011 and 2012, it focused on uh, a very, very strategic um, placement of buildings and services for the elderly in parts of the city. The second platform has to do with the Village Life Outreach Project. This was started in 2004 by a professor at the University of Cincinnati. The focus is to promote life, health, and education in Tanzania. Once again, the paradigm was to mobilize interdisciplinary teams of faculty, students, and staff to change the quality of life in this impoverished part of Tanzania. The values behind this are that this is a partnership. It's going to be sustainable. Our approach to the citizens there must be one of integrity, and we have a long-term commitment. We're not coming in there and then going away. We've been there continuously, and we will be there until the problems disappear. So this shows you the breadth of faculty and students that are focusing as teams on solving the problems in Tanzania. There are 11 colleges, students and faculty from 11 colleges and institutes at the university, including the hospital, that are coming together as interdisciplinary teams to solve these problems. Examples of what they've accomplished. They've improved water quality and the quantity of water in the area. They've built 400 slow sand filters. They've incorporated uh, solar disinfection and using trees and built latrines to separate uh, uh, fecal uh, contamination from water supplies. And they've 
uh, the business students have provided small loans to villagers to enhance entrepreneur entrepreneurial opportunities so that the citizens of this village can help themselves. In terms of education, the nutrition project, there are now 1,200 students that are fed daily because of, of solutions that have been uh, hatched by the faculty and students of these interdisciplinary teams. We engage students in the Cincinnati schools. The education project has resulted in providing tuition and transportation and classroom renovation by the architecture students and urban planning students. And our College of Education, the students and faculty from that have provided focus groups and lesson plans so that these young children in Tanzania can actually obtain an education. In terms of health, our nursing students, our medical students, our pharmacy students, and students in the College of Business, business have come together to develop mobile, mobile field, field clinics, buses that are fully equipped with these individuals to provide health care so that 8,500 patients are treated on an annual basis. They have introduced preventative health care mechanisms so that malaria and waterborne illness is actually now uh, being addressed and the dental hygiene problem of the individuals in Tanzania um, is being addressed. And most dramatically now, um, the architecture students, the engineering students, the business students, and the design students have finally created the first, the region's first hospital. And you'll see that in, 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 a, in a coming slide. And 8,000 mosquito nets have been distributed uh, by these uh, teams uh, to fight malaria. And this is the example of the Roche Health Center. Um, it's a, a, a collaboration that involved uh, all of those students and faculty. It's sustainable. It doesn't require uh, electricity or, or plumbing. Um, and you can see here, the concept here has resulted in a real hospital, the first and only permanent healthcare facility in that region that serves 25,000 villagers. This shows you some of the people that have been impacted because of the work of these teams. And their work has been recognized by uh, President Obama. The last example is that focusing on uh, a partnership with industry. And it's called the Live Well Collaborative. And in this case, the interdisciplinary teams work together with individuals from companies to create new products to serve the aging population in the United States. We build an incubator in a dilapidated part of Cincinnati to revitalize that area and where there are studios where these teams can get together and try to solve those problems. It's a major problem. The American population is aging and the amount of money that is spent on these products is going to be $3.3 trillion a year. And so basically you can see some of the outcomes. When you bring a design student and faculty member together with an engineering student and a faculty member, together with a business student, together with somebody uh, that understands um, both uh, health and economic issues, you result in these kinds of new products that come out uh, of these in, in, in this interdisciplinary model of education. So here, this is pretty cool. This is a, a, a design of what will probably be an autonomous car that opens up that way, and it's very easy for elderly people to get in and out of. And then the top comes back down, and the car has sensors so that you can plug in the destination and the car will go by itself while you play with your iPad or text or something like that, will go to your destination and can sense um, pedestrians and cars so you don't get into an accident. And some other examples of products that have been designed by our interdisciplinary teams include new mobility devices and also new hospital gowns that are a little bit more uh, dignified uh, for those that are being treated. And also, finally, here you can see, if you take urban planning students together with architecture students, design students, and business students, we are developing entire new schemes for placing different kinds of buildings and services together in certain quadrants of the city to make it easy for the elderly to get from one place to another uh, in the most efficient manner. So that's that. This is our new a contribution, a new invention in higher education at the University of Cincinnati. And what our hope is that this new paradigm will help solve 
the real problems of the world. And in, in, by doing that, to contribute to the education of our students, these are some of our students at the University of Cincinnati, but more importantly, to make these students global change agents that can really solve real-world problems for the next generation of children. Thank you.